Good morning, communists. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> communists, anarchists, uh, everybody over here on the left side of the spectrum. Exactly. We're back with one of our most precious segments, which is Cat Watch. Oh, hell yeah. What's your cat doing? News from the cat front. This is a story from a few days ago. I was laying on the couch and my new cat, whose name is Higgins, he is a black cat, perfect goblin prince, just a mess. <laughs> He's very slutty. So he was like on top of me, just like we're having the best cuddles. And mm. then he looks up and my desk is like behind my couch and then behind the desk is my chair. And Remy was yeah. in the office chair. He looks up and sees Remy and like kind of does like a, like a jump. And then he bites me and runs away like he's embarrassed to be caught with me. <laughs> no, I wasn't hanging out with the humans. You know, I hate humans. Fuck them. <laughs> I was so mad. Well, maybe he was like feeling kind of aggressive toward Remy and mm. maybe redirected aggression, you know? <laughs> it's like, Remy's way over there, but you're right here. You're right bite. here. <laughs> and then takes off. <laughs> yeah. I still can't tell if they're friends or not. They, they play fight. It's a work in progress. They're rivals, you know? <laughs> they are rivals. <laughs> All right. Uh, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to be doing a reading. Hell yeah. And uh, it's on a topic that we really haven't dived into ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I would say this is kind of one of our blind spots. Yeah, and more broadly, I think it's it's gen it can be a blind spot on the left sometimes. Um, if you're not, you know, aware, if you're not centering that and like uh i don't know paying attention to other movements and stuff yeah today we'll be reading capitalism and disability selected writings by marta russell and the section we'll be reading is actually available online just kind of google it and you'll find the chapter available so yeah yeah and we can put a link in our show notes as well definitely also if you want to follow along with our notes, you can join the Patreon, put some of that money toward your comrades in mutual aid. Hell yeah. Uh, and you'll be able to follow along with our notes. So before we get going, I wanted to do just a real quick rundown on who Marta Russell is. Uh, I okay. found yeah. her while originally researching for this episode. I was like, I don't know anything about like disability rights. Like who knows mm -hmm. things? And her name came up a couple of times. So I, I did some searching and I found this reading. So. I couldn't find a lot on her biography. I think, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Very short Wikipedia page. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. But she seems really cool. So she was born in 1951 in Mississippi, and she was born with cerebral palsy, which kind of just progressed mm. as she got older. Okay. She worked in LA as a visual effects artist, most notably on Tron, like the original Tron movie. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's and I'm awesome. like, for visual effects, that's a great way to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, had your work cut out for you. That's cool. That's awesome. And then she started getting more and more involved with disability rights as her cerebral palsy progressed. And mm -hmm. she got involved with ADAPT, originally called Americans Disabled for Accessible Public Transit. And now it's American Disabled for Attendant Programs Today. Okay. I think it gets mentioned in the reading, right? ADAPT. I th believe so. Yeah, so we'll come back to them. So she got more and more into photography and writing and journalism. Um, she co-produced a documentary called Disabled and the Cost of Saying I Do. And she wrote Beyond Ramps, Disability at the End of the Social Contract and Capitalism Disability, which is what we'll be reading from today. Awesome. So yeah, one of the leading um, disability rights advocates in her time. I believe she's passed on and... This reading, yeah, is by Marta Russell and in a kind of selection edited by Ravi uh, Malhotra. And it's from 2002, so it's a little dated. Um, and we, it's at points we can kind of update some of the, like, the numbers specifically and things like that. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I really liked this reading. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> One yes, of the things I read about her was that she says she is left, not liberal. And I'm like, well, you already got me. <laughs> and this reading is definitely in that same vibe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly. It's not messing around with liberal bourgeois reformism as its goal. Yeah. I really like how it kind of sets up that difference too mm -hmm. w within the, the scope of disability rights and activism. 
Yeah, so let's get into it from the top then. Let's do it. We start out with kind of a discussion of the definition of disability, Mm -hmm. which I mean, I think needs to be at the top because a lot of people coming to this myself, I'm talking about myself. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Uh, me too. (laughs) You know, don't, don't really get why that's a question it's like okay well you're either disabled or you're not and like it's pretty obvious like you either have a quote-unquote normal Mm -hmm. body or you don't you have something quote wrong with you right yeah so we did a little bit of crowdsourcing for this episode and i i asked around like on twitter and instagram what people wanted to know about and a lot of people brought up mental disabilities which is something Uh, we don't think about as much like Mm -hmm. and anything from like being like mentally disabled in like what you normally would think about sense um Mm -hmm. and then also like things like mental illnesses or autism and like it's just there's a broad spectrum of disabilities like i think a lot of people just think like wheelchair that's it and that's not necessarily just it what they call that is centering like mobility Mm -hmm. disability like i mean because it's the most like visibly obvious one probably right yeah and it's just what i guess what comes to mind for a lot of people uh, but yeah, like you said, there's a there's a broad spectrum of it. And so when we get into the definition of that, Russell kind of puts this dichotomy of a biological definition is not a good idea. Like it, it, it's, mm-hmm. it focuses on like trying to fix or like make whole again disabled people. And like there's something wrong with you that needs to be like brought back to regular person, you know. Yeah, versus definitely. like this is how you are and that's okay and let's make the world right for you and 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 something that you can take a part in. I I love how she sets up basically the idea of society chooses to make people the problem instead of like the environment they're in and yes. that's everywhere from like jobs to homes to whatever kind of things they're trying to navigate. Like I remember I saw this gosh, I can't remember where it was, but I saw this image of like somebody's house and it was just like totally fitted for a wheelchair user like all the counters were lower and like everything was just adapted to them i'm like that's great like yeah why can't we just do that (laughs) yeah and the cool thing i think about like accessibility in that way whether for people with mobility conditions or 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 whatever uh however you're making it more accessible is like usually it's going to be more accessible to everyone yeah so i heard that as well I think it was Uber or maybe Lyft, mm-hmm. one of those. They had like a a version of their app for deaf drivers and it just like flashes at you and stuff whenever you need to do something instead mm, of yeah. like speaking out loud. And it turns out like non-hearing impaired people were using it too because they just didn't want to talk to their passengers, <laughs> which yeah. I'm like, I mean, that's a mood. I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> for um, sure. So yeah, usually when we make these changes, like even ramps i was reading about that in um invisible women those are also really useful for people who are carrying strollers or you know grocery carts and you know all kinds of other things so like yeah when we improve things for some people it'll probably improve things for everybody yes yeah i think that's one of the keys here is that this i don't know we'll get into it a little more about how people criticize the demands of Mm -hmm. disability rights advocates and and why that's stupid why why it's bad to oppose us. I, I want to go back to the making the people a problem. I think for me as like a queer person and as a fat person, like that super rang home with me. The idea of like, you're outside of normal. So that's a problem. Mm. We need to fix that. And especially yeah. like the medicalization being a problem, like mm-hmm. someone interested in gender and how that affects people like that is definitely a thing and we're seeing that more and more yeah yeah looking to like is it cure get back to normal mm-hmm. and like having a very strict medical definition of gender like all that shit it's it's a problem <laughs> yes yeah for sure again initially we're, we're talking about definitions and saying that the point of the article i think is moving past that biological definition saying okay well what would it look like if we look at this through labor relations? If we look at this through like a social category, disability as something that society creates as a definition, Mm -hmm. you know, okay, well then let's look at how does that play out in history? If we're, if we're saying society creates it, well then how did that come to be? 
Yeah, I thought this was a really interesting take. Very materialist, basically saying that, like, mm-hmm. as we moved into pure wage labor, being disabled became a problem. I mean, it was a problem before in like a different way, but it became more of like a well, you can't do X amount of you know Y in this amount of time, so like you're not going to be able to work. Yeah. They talk about in feudalism, pretty much disabled people could usually contribute in some way. That was because uh, there hadn't arisen this factory system of like regimenting labor, Mm -hmm. division of labor, everything where it's like some guy with a stopwatch sitting there watching you (laughs) like, you got to do it this fast, right? Yeah. It was more like, especially agricultural societies and stuff, like the flow of time was more cyclical, circular and there were times when he had to do a lot of work and not a lot of work and so definitely you know, people yeah. who couldn't do like you know as much work as anyone else it was fine you could still like contribute and nobody was going to be like you know fuck you you know yeah yeah exactly and i'm sure there was always like some task like i don't know carding wool or something i i don't know <laughs> i don't know enough about old-timey tasks but <laughs> But yeah, there was like harvest time and like, yeah, that's a very physical job. And then there's just like, you're just chilling in the winter time. Like, what are you going to (laughs) do? Yeah. And again, you know, we're mostly talking about movement disabilities, but like Mm -hmm. people still had the same disabilities they have today. It was just, we don't really hear about them because the only history they ever write usually is about the rich people. That's true. So, I mean, these people still existed and they still, you know, were getting by. Uh, But the author talks about how in the introduction of capitalism the owners of the means of production so the capitalists right the restaurant owners the factory owners the whoever you know the business guys Mm -hmm. they now start getting to basically define disability in terms of being below the norm that they set up in terms of productivity yeah basically like okay you can't meet this standard so i'm not gonna hire you so yeah yeah. And it's, a, I mean, it's a matter of profit. Mm-hmm. It's a matter of their bottom line. And again, but my boss is nice, but <laughs> this one capitalist is nice, but they give so much money to charity. Okay. That's fine. They can be a good person. They can be nice to you, but they are still like as a, in their class, in charge of their company, pathologically driven toward profit or they fail. Yeah. I mean, this, tension comes up again and again between basically the need for profit and the need to basically exploit people for that profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's dependent on that. And so we'll get into this when we start talking about the disability rights movement is that while that's, it's kind of a fight for inclusion in, you know, in this profit making in this exploitative system. So you are now treated, you know, you're, you're included. Great. But (laughs) It's a bad one to be included in. I'll stay home. Right. You know, it was bad to be excluded from too in a way, but like the problem is the system, not. Yes. I mean, the discrimination is bad and we should fix it, but also let's move past that too. Sounds familiar because when you think about like liberal inclusion in general, that's always the goal is like hire more, you know, you know, black women CEOs. And it's like, yeah, sure. You should do that. But also like, how about we don't have CEOs? (laughs) Yeah. We'll see this in the move from disability rights activism to disability justice. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the more modern umbrella term for it. Cool. Let's keep going. So when we talk about like, I don't want to say that like inclusion just straight up isn't important, obviously, or that rights in general are important because like we see as that industrialization happens and as like you have people who are now unable to provide for themselves like there are devastating consequences and this reading yes. goes over them things like workhouses asylums prisons colonies involuntary mm-hmm. sterilization like that was crazy they said uh by 1938 33 american states had sterilization laws and between 1921 and 1964 over 63,000 disabled people were involuntarily sterilized that's insane. <laughs> yeah, that is. And I mean, what? It comes from that seeing people as less, seeing mm-hmm. people as not not fully human or not fully worthy of whatever rights that you have. I, yeah, I, I think you're, you're definitely correct to say, like, rights are important and we don't want to be, you know, we're not opposed to that, obviously. <laughs> no, 
question of rights. We just don't think that they should be the limit of your horizons. You shouldn't limit yourself to bourgeois rights within yeah, yeah. a capitalist system. You should fight for them, demand them, say fuck you to anybody who wants to deny those to you. But like, that's not it. You know, that's not the only thing. I think my thing is, is that it's fascinating in like a grotesque way, how quickly ultra capitalism always pivots right back to eugenics. It's just <laughs> insanely so. It's like that's just, you know, a, a slight step upward or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's what the fucking, it's what people say all the time. It's like, well, it's about survival of the foodist, you know, like fucking social Darwinism. It's like, do you know where that goes, right? Like, do you hear yourself? Yeah, and, you know, it's. I think it's funny because the social Darwinists and, and uh, just the ruthless marketeers, right? The people who are like, well, that's the free market. That's just mm -hmm. what, you know, if you're on the streets and you die, so what? And those sorts, right? Mm -hmm. These people only really like that system when it's benefiting them, when they're the <laughs> ones on top. Yeah. Uh, look at today. I mean, and don't want to date us too much, but like we're in a tight <laughs> labor market and everybody's like, oh, nobody wants to work. Nobody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're whining that the workers won't get to work and exploit themselves. But I mean... Why That's would the you free labor market, man? Yeah. Like, yeah, you it. should say, <laughs> oh, if it's the free market, then maybe that employer should make themselves more enticing. Like, mm, come on. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> weird. Ugh. Weird how that works. <laughs> weird. Super weird. Ugh. Okay. What's next? All right. So, yeah, the article continues. It's kind of historical outline going through after World War II and the expansion of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. I thought this was interesting because it lays out like a pro and a con. The good thing being that there's more provision of social services by the state. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, the state is like all up in your business trying to say, hey, are you disabled? Hey, this is what it means to be. Hey, here's what we're going to do for you. Here's what you have to, you know, prying. And I think that's even like even more increased medicalization, increased basically just lack of privacy. Yes, yeah. And it, and it affects people like in crazy ways, like marriage equality. Mm, okay. So when someone says marriage equality, you're probably like, yeah, we have that. Good job. Go gays. Like, <laughs> nice. Yes. <laughs> we victory. did it. Which, like, cool. Yeah. Not for everybody. Uh, because if you are disabled, a lot of disabled people c cannot get married because of their income basically it'll take their spouse's income into account and mm -hmm. you become too rich to use medicaid and without medicaid these treatments are just not affordable in any way like insanely not so a lot of people will just never get married or choose even like once they become disabled choose to get divorced it's super fucking sad whoa and if both partners are disabled they get a marriage penalty meaning that because you're a couple you'll get less income even if like you have like different needs like it's insane like i just yeah it's really fucking sad that's crazy so what should they do about that that sounds kind of messed up i mean just give people more in general <laughs> like don't be yeah. so fucking stingy with it i think yeah i mean i think to me that that just is very clearly the downside of that welfare state of like constantly checking in on people to make sure like we're so worried about fraud that we're really just hurting people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we've said that before is like, it doesn't matter if like a few people get some extra stuff, like that's fine if everyone gets what they need, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just ridiculous that people have to go through so many hoops to get this. Like I was trying to understand this issue and it was really complicated. And like, that is the, surface level definition that I could glean from like a few articles and such, but like, it's a very, like just navigating those systems as a disabled person seems super fucking confusing and it's just like time consuming. Yes. Yeah. That's just fucked up. It is. That's why we say, I guess, welfare isn't necessarily how we're going to get through everything or the bourgeois, you know, the, the scraps of capitalism, getting enough of them, that's not ultimately going to be our goal. Because mm -hmm. they're always going to try to pull this. Even if we like win a fight and we're like, great, they're going to give us twice as much. Like that's a good win, but they're going, you know, it's going to be a generation and then they're going to be like trying to claw it back. Ronald Reagan style, you know? Yeah, definitely. So as disabled workers are more and more, I mean, basically impoverished 
by their yes. state. You know, and they're trying to find work, right? And what happens? Basically, what happens is like it's it's again, it's not like a mustache guy being like, I fucking hate people who are disabled. Like that's right. not yeah. necessarily what's going on. No, not at all. Most of the time. Basically, the disabled people are going to be the direct producers of labor. Like they're they're the workers, right? Yeah. And if their disabilities prevent them from like basically increasing the profit for the owners, then like they're not going to hire them. Like that's just the calculus they have to do. And mm -hmm. that's why you have small businesses like up in arms every time there's some sort of requirement dealing with disability saying like i can't afford to hire a disabled person it's like well what the fuck man <laughs> uh yeah like I, I was thinking that too it's like if your profits depend on you you know depend on you on being, being ableist <laughs> like yeah like what kind of fucking business is that and like uh -huh. i mean same thing with like healthcare and like all that shit like if you can't afford to like treat your workers with humanity yeah, I don't think you get to have business guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. Why do you get the right to do that and to, to, to leech off of their profit? Cause again, you're not really bringing a lot to the, Oh, you're bringing your innovation, your entrepreneurial spirit, whatever. <laughs> I mean, that's not a ton in comparison to the real actual labor going into, to making your shit or to producing whatever it is you produce or give, giving whatever service it is that you yeah, I don't think your like pool supply store is gonna fucking change the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ultimately, you know, you come up with your dumbass mission statement or whatever, sure, but like you're there to make profit, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what it is. Yeah, and so yeah, the discussion here is just again driving home that this is a ruthless process that you know, that crushes people. I mean that like excludes people and then they're not like completely not cared for at all. There are these welfare prov provisions that we were talking about, but like it, it's, it's kept to such a level because our society is so like anti welfare pro like mm -hmm. Protestant work ethic sort of thing. And I realize this is actually being very American centric, but yeah, yeah, yeah here we are. That is our bias. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have this like drive to everybody needs to be working just for the virtue of work. Mm -hmm. right? And everyone who's not needs to be poor to convince them to work. Like that's what you're shoving people toward because, you know, these people who are pursuing profit and who may not individually be greedy are as business owners, as a capitalist class, like they are pursuing profit. And that means they need to get rid of anyone who can't produce enough. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, they're going to either try to pay those people less or like try to get tax breaks for these kinds of things. Like they will do whatever they can to make a profit on these people who are just mm -hmm. trying to survive because like, and it's insane. Like they're trapped in this system where like, basically they're trying to make little enough so they can apply for Medicaid because a lot of these, a lot of people's like yeah. disabilities are so expensive to care for. Like if you need a home healthcare worker, like you're fucked. Like that yes. basically requires you to be on Medicaid because it is so expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you, and you, you're limited, like you said, in what jobs you can take because of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, both like physically and financially, you are completely limited. Yeah. You're basically trapped in poverty and that's fucked up. Yeah. We'll get to the alternatives. Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is too sad. Hold on. Yes. It's not all bad. I thought this next point was really interesting. The mm. idea of this kind of fear around becoming disabled that we definitely do to people. It's real fucked up. Yeah. This is um, a means of disciplining the workforce, right? Mm -hmm. Of saying, uh, you know, you better stay in line. You better do these things and whatever. It's, it's like this lingering fear, this looming fear over, over workers that they could end up in this excluded in this a, you know, hyper oppressed group. Yeah. And like it talks about safety and like, I mean, it's very easy to skimp on that. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like it's another thing where like, they're always going to put profit before people. And, you know, I'm thinking about like Harlan County, USA, like that uh -huh. definitely happened. Like some people are severely physically ill and disabled from their work. And that's because those you know, in that case, the coal operators and everything were cutting corners. 
But in any case, I mean, everybody has heard of at least or experienced a boss, a manager, somebody who, you know, didn't want to go through all the steps, mm -hmm. didn't want to follow every single procedure because they wanted to save some time, save some money. You know, we've all yeah. been there. Yeah. And one more thing to add to that, we were talking about like the reasons why the, you know, the government wants to keep the safety net meager. Mm -hmm. You know, another reason is, is again, that disciplining of the workforce. Like if you have a comfortable social safety net, like, Hey, don't worry, man. If you, if you can't work, like it's fine, you'll still get to exist. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what people are complaining about when they are like, Oh, nobody wants to work or whatever. It's mm -hmm. like they need some sort of cruel compulsion to get people to go subject themselves to the tyranny of somebody and temporarily enslave themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It is very much this, uh, I don't want to say conspiracy, <laughs> but it's this pattern of finding vulnerable people, whether that's like vulnerable because like, Hey, your land's been fucking stolen or like, Hey, you have an illness. And so you have to work to support yourself or whatever it is, mm -hmm. finding these desperate people to take shit conditions in their job because they need a job and then like you can exploit them because they don't have another choice yes yeah and that's part of the reason why they want to keep benefits of any sort as low as can be or tied to work mm -hmm. so that they can make people go and give up surrender the their you know the value of their labor that's just going to be stolen by this person yeah i this is something that blew my mind recently. Not that recently, because I don't want to sound like a total dumbass. <laughs> we'll never have 0% unemployment. Like, that's just not a thing that will ever fucking happen. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and there's a reason for it. We can't have that. Not everyone can have a job. Like, it's just not a thing. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to threaten people with unemployment yeah. so that they continue to put up with bullshit. The reserve army of the unemployed. Yeah. So if, if anyone's ever like, oh, yeah, they're definitely bringing down unemployment, just be like, how much? Because like, it ain't going to be all the way. No. And people like to say, oh, that's just people like switching from jobs and blah, blah, blah. And there may be like half a percent, not, not even half a percent. But yeah. Also, the, the stats, percent. the way we collect stats on that is fucked up. It's insane. Yeah. No, but the real reason is they need a, yeah, they need a discipline measure. They mm -hmm. need, they need the a credible threat. <laughs> and that's what we're seeing now is like, you know. I see it in some spaces in, t in, in, uh, teachers, you know, forums and stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. we need to just start like wearing jeans one day, man. Like they tell us <laughs> "Oh, you're supposed to be up here in business casual. I'm like, what are you going to do, man? Are you going to fire me and try to <laughs> hire someone? Cause guess what? No one's out there. Yeah. Like, and I think more and more, hopefully workers are kind of realizing the power that we have. Yeah. You know, collectively. Yeah, definitely. It's like, what happens if we just don't show up? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This next part is insane. I keep saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> so basically saying, okay, so you have this group of people who can't work and, you mm -hmm. know, they try to work and then they are discriminated against in the hiring process. And it all comes down to like, how can we turn this body of people into profit, even if we can't exploit them in the traditional sense? Yeah, that's wild because like, yeah, you're, they are looking first to just leech your productivity, <laughs> right? They're just looking to make you make something that's valuable and then give you only a pittance of it, mm -hmm. right? That's Option what they, a. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what they're used to doing. That's they're, they're specialized in it. They know a lot of ways to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, say, okay. Oh man, right. that didn't work. Yeah. Plan B. <laughs> Plan B is basically like the care system, like the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, this stat was crazy. Disabled people are worth more to the GDP when occupying a bed than a home, basically. Like people can make more money off of disabled people if they're institutionalized in some way than yes. if they're like living on their own. Again, that medicalization we were mentioning, mm -hmm. they're saying, you you know, you have to be treated. We have to try to make you whole again. And now they can use somebody else's, you know, labor. They can steal their value and send them in to treat you and make money that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like, that's not to say that like 
I don't know. I don't want to, because when I was reading this at first, I was like, well, medicalization, like, does that mean like medicine is bad? Like, I was like, what are they saying here? Yeah, I just want to clarify, like, that's not what that means in this reading. Mm -hmm. It basically is saying that, like, yeah, you should be able to get whatever treatments you need. But in terms of medicalization to the point of, like, we are trying to cure you, and that is not always what the person wants or what is best for them, both, like, financially and physically. And, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's just, there's a smart way to do it. (laughs) There's a humane way to do it. Yeah. I think that in this case, it's also talking about, like, over institutionalizing people i think for Mm -hmm. a very small you know subset of people this is kind of the the best option for them but i think they're saying like the capitalists were kind of pushing too far in that direction just to get money well if you think about it if you have a disabled family member and you're working constantly you're not going to have time to care for them so like Mm -hmm this becomes your only option and it's an option that happens to make a fuck ton of money yes, for someone else yeah. so in in a more just world where you could not you could just choose not to work and still be comfortable then you could like devote time that you would prefer to you know to help them and that's not for everyone either we're not saying that's the universal model like what if you're you know very not your skill set is not you're not equipped for it that's okay <laughs> Yeah, like that should still be an option, but it, it's just a lot of people are pressed into it. Yeah, it's just it's fucked up to make that like a profit-seeking thing of like, yeah, I'll take care of your your whoever for you. Mhm. Okay. So the next section, disability rights movements, the prospects and limitations starts talking about, okay, how have people advocated for themselves, you know, mm-hmm. or how people advocated on their behalf. Yeah. Uh, talking about like charitable organizations and stuff. Which I thought you might like. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought this part was great. I love the distinction between organizations that are controlled by disabled people and ones that are run for them. Like that can often turn really paternalistic. It can mm-hmm. turn very much like we're trying to help you, we're trying to cure you, you know, whatever it is. And when really, yeah, like if this is a movement about disabled people, like disabled people should be at the center of it. No fucking shit. <laughs> Yes, for sure. And that's part of, that's one of the central things of the disability justice movement is they want, you know, the leadership of the most impacted people, you know, they Mm -hmm. want the actual like ownership of that. Whereas, you know, the charitable model works very much within like the capitalist framework. We've talked about that in Mm -hmm. our charity episode, episode 38. It's a banger. Yeah. Right. With problems there (laughs) in the the charitable sector. Uh, I also like here that Russell talks about the fragmentation, uh, saying like, oh, yes. you, gotta, you know, you're in this disability section, so you're in this. Yeah, you're, you're, you're blind, by you're deaf, charity. you have mental disabilities. Like, again, yeah. that increased medicalization mm-hmm. causing problems in this and, way. And there's not really a need to divide up that much. Like, there should be instead, like, cross-disability solidarity. That's another big part of the modern movement is, like, we should all these different disabilities should be advocating together for disability justice, like as a whole, as not really a reason to divide up like that. Yeah. I mean, as a queer person online, fucking yes. Oh my God. I've seen so many (laughs) bad takes in the past few months. It's just, it's just bad guys. (laughs) Of like infighting amongst different A lot of infighting. Yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely. Um, You know, there's always, biphobia is a classic always around, um, you know, Mm. why aren't we like yelling about healthcare or something? (laughs) You know, (laughs) like, why are we doing this? Why are we turning on each other and firing? Yeah. Yeah. That, but that's because we're on the left. That's what we do. (laughs) We love to infight. We, we're messy (laughs) bitches. Another point that they bring up in terms of nonprofits it, that I thought was like really interesting and like mm-hmm. absolutely true is that nonprofits are often funded by the government. So they can't really criticize the government too much. And that kind of blew my mind. I'm like, oh yeah, like they don't have an incentive <laughs> to change anything actually. <laughs> yeah. If they started, you know, uh, funding worker Soviets <laughs> or uh, they started funding uh, insurrectionary anarchist activities. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or on on the flip side, if the government said, yeah, we're going to fund, you know, health care, guess who's out of a lot of luck? All these, you know, advocacy groups. 
Mm, yeah, they don't want things to change too much. Mm -hmm. They just want to yeah. like help a few individual people that they can put on their pamphlets. Because then your gala is not going to. Um, <laughs> what are you doing that for anymore? You know exactly. All right. Yeah. Then we get into kind of the radical side of things. Yeah, we start talking about some actual like organizations led by, run by disabled people. Hell yeah. First one they talk about is Independent Living. Mm hmm. Uh, based in Berkeley, California. Everything good happens in Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was interesting because they're, they're saying, you know, okay, well, you know, they were promoting the empowerment of disabled people, mm -hmm. focusing on the barriers built by the environment, not mm -hmm. the impaired people. So saying like, hey, you know, it's not our fault or anything. Like, we're fine the way we are. Mm -hmm. Don't build an environment that like accepts us as people, right? Exactly. Um, change your society to accept everyone and not just exclude people. Yeah. And this, this you know, this movement kind of grows. I th thought that the author offered some interesting criticisms of it being kind of like limited. Yeah. It was talking a lot about like access, basically. Mm -hmm. Cool. You can now enter the job market. Good job. You're, you're still going to be forced to be poor because like you need your benefits. So like not a lot of victory. It was like access to those as consumers as part of the marketplace yeah it's that's not great i mean we don't like it here either it's not to, again not to say that like you shouldn't have access to it for sure but then let's push beyond that you know mm -hmm. it's not enough again it's never enough for us <laughs> it's never enough <laughs> you know and like uh, i i think i've said this before but like i think people can come at you very like negatively like what the fuck we're trying like isn't that enough like and it's like no, it's not. <laughs> and, right. and people can view that as very negative. For, but for me, I view it as very positive. Like, no, we can always do better. Like, let's keep going. Yeah. And I think this is one of the, I mean, this goes all the way back to, all the way back to the dawn of our podcast. We're talking about, you know, the communist manifesto and saying, mm -hmm. okay, well, the communists are going to be there fighting for every right, for every improvement within bourgeois democracy. Sure. We're going to mm -hmm. be saying you need to make things more democratic. You need to include more people. Yes. And then we're going to turn around the next day and say, <laughs> that's not fucking enough. I know Do that deal more. that we just hammered out, like we're no longer satisfied with it. You yeah, know, we're pushing yeah. on. Just like that guy in Harlan County said, like, that's, that's what you do. Exactly. That was straight up tactic from the communist manifesto. <laughs> and that's what Always we're about. be agitating. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I did like the comparison from independent living and like mm -hmm. other movements, basically moving it from a private trouble, you know, a very individualized yeah. thing of like, I a personal tragedy. Yes. Right? It's just yes. me. Oh, look what I have to go through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Into more of a social movement. And she makes comparisons to like the women's movement, the civil rights movement and like the queer movement, like all of those movements i think had to kind of do that like i think when you mm -hmm. think of the earliest forms of those movements a lot of them were very individualized you know like look at this one cool black guy who like did this amazing thing and like everyone's like cool good job you know <laughs> like yeah and yeah. then it turned into like okay let's like reckon with the issue of race as a whole and like figure out what the fuck's going on here <laughs> yeah and changing it into a social movement rather than a an individual struggle. Mm -hmm, mm hmm And like with the women's movement too, like that very much could have been like, oh, I'm personally sad because I am home and I want a job or whatever it is. But then it turns into like, oh, why is it that like me and every other woman is at home? And yeah. you know, I'm not alone in this. There's an entire like class, entire sector of society that's feeling the same way. Lots of mm -hmm. people like me. Yeah, the author kind of leaves I.L. saying, like, you know, they did some good things and stuff. They were ultimately kind of limited mm -hmm. by this bourgeois liberal sort of framework. Mm -hmm. And then they move on to talk about kind of some more radical groups. Uh, you had the the League for the Physically Handicapped. Yep. Uh, in, during the Great Depression. We did some civil disobedience. Yeah, yeah. Against, uh, I guess it was the Works Progress Administration. Yeah, nobody's perfect, right? Yeah. I don't, we don't stand anybody here. That's true. Don't, <laughs> no heroes, me. no heroes, but you don't have me as a hero. Uh, <laughs> don't stand me. You can stand me. It's fine. <laughs> uh, 
And then they also mention another organization, the Disabled in Action, mm-hmm. in 1970. What were they protesting? Oh, uh, Nixon was going to cut disability programs, because of course he was. <laughs> yeah, Nixon. Fucking asshole. I mean, most American presidents are, so I mean, yeah, he's just, just trying to fit in. Low bar. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they wanted to have like an on-camera debate with him about that, or whatever they were doing direct protest against that mm-hmm. uh, and then uh there's also a they talk about a the most memorable moment uh being the fight for regulations on the rehabilitation act being issued which sounds kind of boring but basically <laughs> they were making sure that it was illegal for federal agencies and and all that to discriminate on disability mm-hmm. and they've been pushing the administrations but the administrations were like Nah, you know, we don't want to do that. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> and then Carter was like, no, we'll totally do it. But then he looked like he wasn't going to do it. Yeah, he was stalling. Yeah. Uh, and so they went out there in, and I think it was in Berkeley. They occupied the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare building. Hell yeah. You just went in there 25 this days. Was like, this is ours now. <laughs> yeah. For like a month. <laughs> and they, I mean, they backed down. They were like, okay, okay, here you go. Regulations. Yeah. No amendments. Here you go. I mean, direct action, guys. It gets shit done. Yep. And I like the discussion of how that, like, mm, the consequences of that, what they Mm -hmm. learned in the process. I thought that was cool. They basically did a lot of solidarity, like, across different disabilities. And then Mm -hmm. also um, unions and civil rights organizations were, like, donating food. And the Black Panther Party was there helping out, like... That's what we need, y'all. Yeah, cross-movement organizing. So it's not just your movement, right? And this reminded me of um, reminded me of our episode on uh, queerness and communism. That's episode twenty-seven: queer theory and communism. Yeah, it reminded me of you know the importance of kind of intersectionality and the different social movements, like all working together. Because when you peel back the layers of what is actually oppressing us all, you Mm -hmm. eventually get back to capitalism. I guess for me, it's like, we can agree that we're all being oppressed and it's just in different ways. And it's just like capitalism will find a different excuse to oppress different groups for different reasons, basically. Mm -hmm. Like for disabled people, it's like, oh, well, you don't fit into this standard model of worker that I can just like exploit needlessly. And easily, yeah, without cost to me. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, for black people, it's like, well, we exploited your ancestors insanely. And now we're just like going to keep you down and just like try to ignore that that ever happened. Mm-hmm. You know, queer people, you know, it's like, oh, you're trying to like break up the family structure. Can't have that. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. so it's it's all different struggles for sure. And like, we should be able to acknowledge that. And again, acknowledge whatever privileges you have within those systems, but also realize like, hey, it's the same guy. <laughs> yeah. This, this one guy is an asshole to all of us. So it could just be like my problem with him or it could be a problem with this guy. Yeah. 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 It's like we're all showing up like, wait, did that happen to you? Okay. Who who yeah. did it? That same guy? Okay. <laughs> Let's yeah. kill him. <laughs> purdy, purdy. Oh, um, yeah. It's not a real guy, though. You, you can, can symbolically say, threaten Yeah, him. I will symbolically kill capitalism, the man. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that was awesome. They're working with all these different groups, especially shout out to the Black Panthers party. Yeah. So love that. And then we get to kind of newer organizations as of, you know, for this writing and still old for us. 1983. <laughs> yeah. Of the adapt and Americans disabled for accessible public transit. Now I like this one because they were described as having a dramatic flair and you know, that's kind of my whole thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, they did like very public protests to, you know, they were originally founded to protest lack of accessible public transit. Like that mm-hmm. was, that was what the A and the P and T stood for, I guess. So yeah, they were like doing these really public demonstrations, but then from there they, they moved to other issues as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, attendant services and, and things like that, uh, also vital, uh, for their community. And again, this is, um, you might not see this sort of shift as quickly with a charitable organization who's not as in touch, you know, with what do, you know, the people we're representing need because Mm -hmm. they're not made up of them. Whereas, you know, if you're advocating for yourself, you're like, okay, let's shift gears. This is what we need now. And then ultimately we get to 
the what these disability rights fights end up culminating in, which is the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Yeah, yeah. The ADA. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here, and I just wrote gross at one point, um, and that is because there was uh, this quote. There's been a convergence of neoliberal and third way discourses resulting in the mantra that, quote, rights entail responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no such thing as a free right. If you exist on this world, you got to earn it. That's disgusting. <laughs> I mean, I was yeah. just thinking, like, would you tell, like, a slug that they have to earn their right to exist and absolutely yeah that's why they're also exploiting the earth because the earth doesn't just get to exist <laughs> yeah and i mean that's because they see everything i mean they would say like yeah the slug does earn its right to exist because it undergoes the bitter struggle for survival and they <laughs> but they will like want us to all have to do that too Ugh, <laughs> no just leave me and my slugs alone and i thought this uh what do you what do you think about this analysis of of the americans with disabilities act I mean, again, some important stuff in here, for sure. sure. Like, yeah, if you're looking within this system, which let's be real, most people are, <laughs> it's a good idea. Like, yeah, like we shouldn't discriminate. And yeah, we should provide for people in that way. Mm -hmm. But it really is about ending dependency and, and not for like, hey, we're doing this so like you can have a better life, but it's so like, hey, you can work for us. Yes. Yeah access to exploitation which again you don't want to be not in it at all because it's worse <laughs> I, and that's the thing yeah if, if you have to be in the system like fucking i guess be in the system as best you can but like <laughs> I, yeah i guess i just i don't want to begrudge anyone for like doing what they fucking have to to survive you know oh for sure <laughs> just do it guys it we're sucks. all like we work also yeah we like, also do that <laughs> we're yeah so if we're, if we're not calling you a chump or we're calling ourselves chumps. I am a like. chump. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought this was a pretty good um, critique of the Americans with Disabilities Act in that they're saying like these, these are so quasi civil rights. Mm -hmm. Kind of only as long as it's easy enough for businesses and cheap enough for the government to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it very much reminded me of like the liberal obsession with rights and those being like given to people mm, yeah <laughs> like oh thanks for the rights oh yeah, we cool. at some point we won you know the government decided you know what yeah we're gonna give rights to these people <laughs> it's insane it's just like who the fuck are you man <laughs> just to allow me to live right yeah and it talks about that this really doesn't radically change things in terms of like the employment rate yeah yeah I wanted to kind of update these numbers that they have here. Oh, yeah. Gimme. Because these were pretty crazy on their own. So what are the new ones? Well, they're not radically different is the thing. So uh, at some point they talk about 79% of disabled people prefer to work, but only 27.6% were employed. In 2018, the number is 37% are employed. And this, this is disabled people? Yes. Okay. 37% of disabled people are employed by, you know, in 2018. So wow. okay. pretty recently. Uh, and the poverty rate described oh, as three times as likely to be in poverty. It's similar to that. It's 26% in 2018 uh, versus Jesus. what uh, was 10% for the rest of the population. Wow. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. And meanwhile, all the businesses were fucking whining about it, dude. They were all like, oh, my oh gosh. we can't do this. The world's going to end. There's a basically like a clause in there saying that they didn't want to cause, quote, undue hardship for businesses. And that's how they get away with shit. And so apparently of the more than 1,200 cases filed under Title I mm. of the ADA from 1992 to 1998, employers prevailed 92% of the time. Cool law you guys got. Great, yeah. effective law. That's like, you know, slightly better <laughs> chances than like convicting a cop, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, and literally the, the like the next sentence, this professor from Ohio State Law, uh, Ruth Kolker, concludes that, quote, only prisoner rights cases fare as poorly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which like those should also do better, but like, wow. Sure. But I mean, capitalism's treating both like shit. Mm -hmm. They're saying 
these prisoners, we've got them in one place, but we've got these people prisoners in society at large. Yeah, yeah, we can make money off of them if they're, you know, in prison, if they're at home, you know, paying a ridiculous amount for health care, if they're institutionalized in like a nursing home or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, the, you know, clearly it didn't help enough. And you still had the businesses whining about, oh, this is going to cost us so much money and all this. And I don't know, I guess even with a perfect ADA, right, if you imagined mm -hmm. the perfect solution within capitalist society overall, we're still going to go back to our main points that like, there's still going to be unemployment. Mm -hmm. There's still going to be exploitation. It's just going to be like equally distributed now. Right. So yeah. disabled people and non-disabled people are still going to have like the same, you know, they're just going to be impacted by those things equally instead, which yeah. those things still suck and we need to like move past them. Yeah. I guess that's my maybe confusion or like, primary question to to capitalists it's just like what's your ideal because your ideal is pretty shitty for a lot of people like i guess i just am confused mm. as to how people think that's okay because like even if again because again you're not going to have zero percent unemployment that's just like not a thing yeah. so what is your solution you know like <laughs> right <laughs> yeah if you think that everyone has to work to like prove their worth as a person but not everyone can yeah it's they don't and they're just going to be like shrug your shoulders that's just how it is man that's how yeah. it is yes they're going to be like i'm sorry i'm too realistic yeah <laughs> fuck you <laughs> we're getting mad at this imaginary person <laughs> well if only they were only imaginary they're not they're in my dms <laughs> they're terrible <laughs> uh all right then we get to the conclusion yeah i like this quote well, this Aberly guy says, <laughs> suggests that we abandon the notion that production be at the center of any new conceptualization of utopia. And I like that. <laughs> you know, that's a fair point. I think it's like, you know, we can get a little, as socialists, sometimes we can get a little productionist in terms of, especially that social stage where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to their uh, contribution. It's not all about working. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so we've done a lot of a lot of shit talking. <laughs> yeah, and a lot uh, of repeating ourselves. Maybe sorry if we did that too much, but hopefully yeah. you got our main points from that. <laughs> you know, the real answer is hopefully Christine edited this to be like decent. <laughs> make it workable, please. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into what we could do. Let's let's talk solutions. Well, I don't know. I thought this was the way it was. Isn't this just the way it has to be? There's no alternative, right? My good friend, have you heard the good word of socialism? Ah, socialism, that <laughs> boogeyman. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's dive into what might be the socialist alternative to the capitalist hellscape we now inhabit. Oh, yes, okay. Um, bottom line here, you'll be taken care of, which would be great. And not taken care of with the quotation marks around it in a mobster way. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep with the fishes. <laughs> but yeah, basically, instead of saying like, you know, you have to produce this for us or you're not worthy as a human. It's like, okay, you're a human. You're worthy. Mm -hmm. We're still going to try to produce some stuff because we're not like in utopia yet. But like, it's okay if you can't. Yes. Yeah. And maybe so, you know, maybe I was unfairly maligning our own side as being workerist or whatever, or productionist by saying, you know, that's that socialist stage where you have to work to produce. But there is, I mean, the important first part of that phrase, right? From each, according to their ability. That's the thing. The big thing is that we're going to be shifting from prioritizing profit to prioritizing human needs. Yeah, definitely. We're not just like doing this so we can like sit on our yachts and go to fucking space in a dick rocket and, you know, all those <laughs> ridiculous things. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that that makes, that's an important shift in terms of disability because the disabled are no longer an inconvenience mm -hmm. to the system that has to figure out, ah, what, what do we do? You know, how can we make disabled people stop whining at us as cheaply as possible? Yeah. Or how can we like exploit them for money? Like right. in a medical yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. How can we get something from them? Uh, but instead, we're ne uh, disabled people are now one of the integral constituents that the system is designed to serve. Yeah, definitely. Like, you're fine. You're taking care of it. It doesn't well, yeah. matter. 
you're, you're a human with everyone else and society is now geared toward how can we make sure everybody has what they need how can we solve all of our problems together collectively not how can we exploit some for the benefit of others yes yes and now we can like stop the planet from catching on fire that'd be cool and a a beneficial side effect <laughs> <laughs> bonus no devastation on the planet that'd be great <laughs> okay so uh let's talk about an example perhaps and you know maybe not a perfect example nobody's perfect you know no heroes except for me um <laughs> let's talk about cuba all right i've been hearing a lot of things about cuba lately <laughs> Um, don't, doesn't everyone hate it there and they wish they were in America? That's, yeah, that's what I've heard. I've heard that they're <laughs> trying to do all this stuff. Do you want to just kind of briefly touch on this? Let's play a game that we used to play on road trips, which is where I just sit down, you know, <laughs> we get on the highway and then I ask you a big question. Great. What the fuck is going on in Cuba right now? <laughs> all right. So here's the deal. There are protests and things. There have been protests and things. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if they're happening today or what by the time we release going on in Cuba mm -hmm. because they're facing mm, hardships. They uh, don't have a lot of supplies. They don't have a lot of things that they need, like material goods, you know? Why is that? You know, there's, there's this tiny little thing, you see, uh, <laughs> just a small kind of hiccup in the system called the decades-long u.s embargo of cuba oh so it's our fault uh you know that meme with the guy like shooting the guy in the chair then why yeah, would yeah why would the cuban dictatorship do this yes that's yes. kind of what's going on because like okay first of all let's back up first of all if you are a leftist of any stripe you really need to be against the u.s and its allies intervening in cuba Mm -hmm. First of all, I mean, the easy call, but like you still yeah. see that some in some spaces, people being like, if you're a leftist oh. in general, you should probably just be against the United States in general. It's a bad one. Yeah. And, and you should be against like imperialist aggression. And this blockade is part of that. This, this, you know, oh, blockade embargo, whatever. It's part of that. Mm -hmm. Sure. You can have like criticisms of, I don't like that the Cuban government did this or that or whatever. For example, they got special mm -hmm. forces there and, 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 you know, police and stuff going around mm, and, great. and people are saying, oh, they did this to the protesters or whatever. And we don't have like large scale versions of that, but to whatever extent it's occurring, like you can have criticisms for sure. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. You call that critical support. Like, mm. you, you know, you want to be for people trying to build socialism and determining their own path but like you don't have to like everything they do don't have heroes yeah again right yeah yeah for sure but the embargo is not the way to handle that right like that's what's mm -hmm. causing so much suffering there's chronic shortages of of everything people you know don't have what they need and people are dying from that people have been dying for a long time from that um it's barbaric and it needs to go yeah, definitely. Like everything, and we've mentioned this before too, everything Cuba has achieved, it's been with like one hand tied behind their back because they don't have supplies from the United States, which like they need. <laughs> they they are a small island. They cannot produce everything they possibly need. Yeah, for sure. And so people are like protesting because they're, they're suffering, you know, because they're dealing with all this and they're protesting like, try to fix something, government. Mm -hmm. and, and I think some people are saying... You know, maybe change the leadership, change people in government, or, you know, maybe some people are saying like change major government policies. You probably mm -hmm. have some people saying like change the government system itself. Yeah. It's a large, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of people involved. So like, who knows what all feelings are out there. And I think we also have to take whatever media is happening right now like with a big old not a grain i would say a tablespoon of salt oh yeah i mean if you see anything <laughs> from like the miami herald its opinion column is like <laughs> run by the cuban exile community apparently pretty much like it's just completely like why don't we go invade pretty much almost like, mm -hmm. you know? um, but you don't see uh, uh, very many people in cuba uh, clamoring for the u.s to go overthrow their government or Call, mm -hmm. calling for uh, u.s firms to come in and they're not like please come colonize us <laughs> right yeah they're not really interested in going back to work on a u.s owned sugar plantation but yeah you wouldn't understand that from the american press 
we're really <laughs> very i mean like npr when this stuff first kicked off they did something on you know where they interviewed this professor about like what's the situation in cuba or whatever and it was just like all this kind of pro cuban exile Mm -hmm. outlook and everything and saying oh it's been mismanaged and and all these sorts of things and people really want the corrupt dictatorship you know and all this sorts of things but like nobody could manage this situation very well if they were in it i don't think like i don't think so <laughs> they're working from a huge disadvantage like i just don't see how that's <laughs> feasible yeah i mean and even then like the accomplishments they still have made are very impressive. You know, yes. like the, the literacy, the health care, the we're about to talk about the disability rights. Mm -hmm. Oh, the fact that they made a, their own vaccine, you know, yeah. <laughs> like the fact that they are able to accomplish any of that at all. Yeah, uh, it's it's impressive, uh, it, but they're still hampered. Like, you know, the vaccine, for example, they can't get it out to people because the U.S. has uh, an embargo on like syringes and medical equipment. Uh, Mexico's oh actually God. said that they're going to send stuff over to Cuba. I saw that, and that was great. Go yes, Mexico. More countries need to do that, need to stand up to the United States and say, you know what, whatever, who cares, fuck you. Yeah, people are fucking dying, like, eat shit. Yeah, and I don't know. So again, you don't have to personally agree with everything Cuba does. You can say, oh, I want more uh, internal democracy or whatever. Like, sure, yeah, I want that too. Yeah, have whatever opinion you want about it. You know, I have, you know, my opinions of what I hope that they do. Uh, but ultimately, I want it to be up to the Cuban people. I mean, even if they're like, Fuck it, we want to go to capitalism. I don't like that, but like, uh, <laughs> not my favorite you know, choice, but okay. If uh, I don't, I don't want the United States to be deciding what Cuba does. Yeah, and you know, by upholding this embargo and spreading these like sentiments, like they're definitely doing that. Like it's an interventionist policy, and it fucking sucks. Yes. Yeah. Now, <laughs> <laughs> back to what back we were going to gonna talk example. about originally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I found this article talking about somebody's trip to Cuba, um, a disabled person's trip. And basically they're like, it was like really good. <laughs> yeah. So like widespread access to things. They were, they were treated like a, just a person, mm -hmm. a human part of the community or part of, you know, part of their group's community. rather. Yeah, definitely. Like, and that the Cuban government is really about like community based services and like, you know, they have health care. Wow, that's cool. Yep. Emphasis on family involvement and increased access to jobs and resources. And just like, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And I like that it was participatory. Mm -hmm. Like they have large disabled organizations that are like on par with labor unions there. Yeah. And they're like run by disabled people. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's direct democracy and people, you know, again when they're saying oh cuba's this dictatorship whatever and it is a single party state mm -hmm. but like within the communist party you have more of like a direct democracy now, i don't have any personal experience with this this is just from what i've read mm -hmm. but like you can participate in the party at the local level and like basically choose you know pick your leaders and become your leaders yourself like within the party structure yeah and like there's still going to be subgroups like in this example they talk about a hearing impaired group mm -hmm. that convinced the government to introduce a signing system in schools. Like that's huge. Yes. Yeah. You know, you're not donating some money so someone can get a lobbyist to go tell somebody <laughs> to do this thing. Like you yourself are taking part of the political process. So I guess that's why I bring the party part up is like, it's mm, a different form of democracy than where you, you know, we're used to electoralism, mm -hmm. go take care of the problems for me, but this is more participatory at the local level and then kind of building your way up to the national level. And I think too, we were talking about how basically strapped everyone is for, you know, avoiding poverty. Yeah. <laughs> Time, yeah. money, just mental health in general. If you're in a system where your basic needs are taken care of, you're going to have more time and energy for that kind of stuff. Like, I can't imagine, you know, going out and trying to fucking make real change in this current capitalist system. That's very hard to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I and should do it, but people don't. <laughs> sure. We're just, we're squeezed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And in a socialist society, you wouldn't have uh, that situation. Not to say you wouldn't work or do anything, but like you would have more free time because society is not about how much extra shit can we pile up so that some rich asshole can do something stupid with it it's about how can we make sure everyone has what they need to mm -hmm. be like complete as a human yeah which obviously as we've seen in kiba is still hard to do but 
Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to do when the global hegemon is like <laughs> looming over you saying, we're about to kill you, you know? Yeah, honestly, the fact that they're like 90 miles from the United States and have done this well is shocking. Yeah. And again, just, you know, sometimes people can't grasp this. It's hard to grasp because embargo sounds kind of clean and kind of mm -hmm. like nonviolent. It sounds very diplomatic. It's violence. It's hurting people every day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is kind of a tangent. We might cut it. <laughs> I watched the first episode of Voyager last night. Have you seen it? Uh-huh. Uh, the one where they get thrown out in the first place? Yeah, yeah. And they yeah. encounter this, like, alien who's, they call him the caretaker. And he's, like, this basically super advanced race. So he is, like, a blob guy, they eventually find out. But he's taking care of this <laughs> planet because he feels bad because he accidentally, like, destroyed their planet, like, ecosystem. Oh, and they yeah. live underground. And he's, like, supplying them with power and all this shit. And they, like, forget how to do stuff and become really dependent on him and then he realizes dying and then i don't know at the end i got really mad because like the captain was like well i'm gonna destroy the thing because like they need to figure out uh -huh. like how to live on their own because because yeah. another like the surface people that still survived were trying to take over it and she's like well i can't let them destroy this people i'm like those people didn't have the caretaker like fuck you you're by destroying this thing you were taking it away from them too you know, Whoa, like yeah. she thought she was being all like not interventionalist or whatever, but like, oh, just well, she's really meddling bad. directly. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. Weird. It's anyway. not really prime directive. Yeah, and also this thing could have gotten her home, and she just like made that decision for everybody. Whatever. Sorry, <laughs> kind of a tangent there. <laughs> I'm still yeah. deciding on whether or not Jane May is um, a little bit Reaganish. So. Ooh, okay. When was Voyager? It was um, 2000. Okay, interesting. Anyway, interesting episode. <laughs> we might. We'll have that. to do like a Star Wars, a Star Trek breakdown. I really want to do a Star Trek episode. Let's say eventually the time comes. <laughs> Socialism, whether that's through a worker state, mm -hmm. we abolish the old state, we bring in the worker state, mm -hmm. or we do like an anarchist, like yeah. loose federation thing, and then we develop from there. Yeah. Eventually. We move on towards, you know, the communists move on to actual communism. Yeah. We make our first replicator. <laughs> and yes. We can move forward. Or eco. We mm. learn to use less. Oh, yeah. We go full, and, like, agricultural pastoralism. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be, like, rudimentary, but, like, we find ways to conserve yeah. more and, you know. Like, yeah, definitely. The Earth's balance. Yeah, that'd be great too. Yeah, so basically, we're talking, you know, luxury gay space communism of some stripe. We know that's like eco communism, could be anarcho communism, Star Trek. <laughs> that's for the future to figure out, right? Yes, Star Trek, but less military, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. Definitely. Um, Although I can, I can dig the uh, uniforms. I do love a jumpsuit. <laughs> I look great in a jumpsuit. Anyway, so we're there. We're in Utopia. What does disability? look like um and i think it just looks like bodies that are taken care of and again not just valued for labor and mm -hmm. even less so now because it's like we're good we don't like we're not struggling for survival anymore so you can kind of just do what you want right <laughs> yeah valued um not in spite of but because of mm -hmm. you know who you are yeah disabled whatever identities you have we're all part of you know this rich varied human tra tapestry at that point you know we're we're all together in the unity of mankind basically hippie shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds great see we got to the happy part eventually yes but yeah i i like that idea of i mean that idea in general <laughs> obviously <laughs> but no I, I like the idea of um being valued not in spite of but because of that's a very important narrative for me because i, yeah. I think that as someone who's like slightly outside the, the this heteropatriarchy, it is, I think, yeah, that initial struggle, like when I think back to my first days of like college feminism or like the body positive movement, the initial struggle is always about how can I fit into this? How can I say like, yeah, I am as tough as a guy or um, yeah, I am sexy even though I'm fat. And it, it mm. you start there and like, that's an important building block for a lot of people. Yeah. But for a lot of people, that's where they stop. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I think 
coming to terms with what's beyond that has helped immensely saying like, wait, why do I like have to be sexy? Or like, why do I, what is the value of masculinity? Like, what is the value of, you know, being super productive and hustle culture and like all those things, just taking a step back and be yeah. like, but why though? <laughs> yeah, no, and I think that's what like, um, that's what they're talking about here in, in the article that mm -hmm. we read was like you start with rights and inclusion and mm -hmm. you move to like, I'm just as good as so and so and then it's like why yeah. do I want to be just as good as so and so so and so kind of sucks <laughs> yeah why well, do I want to be in this system that exploits me like it exploits me like yeah. let's move past that same know? with like gay marriage it's like yeah I love being married it's like one of my fave things but at the same time it's like I can recognize how that can be a harmful and like perpetuating a nuclear family and like all these systems that are like not so great <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah Again, our, I think our main theme today was it's not enough. Like Not enough. <laughs> stay angry. <laughs> yeah. Could be better. Keep fighting for more even the day after you just got a big victory. Never <laughs> give a five-star review. Always save that last star. There you go. <laughs> Until I see a replicator that doesn't fuck up the environment, I'm always going to give four stars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do replicators actually mess with the environment? I don't know. It's never really addressed. They probably have quasi infinite energy or can build a dyson sphere we gotta do a deep so. dive star trek episode i'm ready <laughs> all right so yeah before we get into like the end of the show uh, i did want to kind of take a moment to kind of point people uh in the right direction or in a direction there may be way more directions there's probably a lot uh but it towards some resources in terms of like learning more about the disability justice movement uh today mm-hmm um, and what they can do, uh, specifically like radical, you know, or not, you know, these kind of liberal reformist sorts of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What you got? And this is not comprehensive. This is just, you know, a little bit out there uh, that I found. Uh, but there's a few that are based in cities called disability justice collectives. Okay. Uh, in New York City, Seattle, Vancouver. They probably have them in more locations as well. Uh, but they follow what are called like the 10 principles of disability justice, which is kind of what we're talking about in terms of like intersectionality, leadership by disabled people, all that sort of stuff, cross movement, cross disability and anti-capitalist. Sounds great. Um, so yeah, these are, are guys that you want, you would want to people that you would want to check out. There's like kind of an artist's collective, um, of disabled people called sins invalid. Ooh, okay. Uh, that is kind of a part of this disability justice network. Okay. So I found their work pretty interesting and there's, you know, of course, different, uh, they, they've got a lot of different, you know, creators involved in that space that I think is, uh, that I think would be cool to check out. So if you, you know, if you go toward any of those and, and kind of explore, you can see some more, some more of what we've been talking about and ways to, you know, if you're a disabled person or if you just want to be an ally to them, ways to get involved in that. Hell yeah. All right, what are we doing next week? Uh, next week, we're going to open up the mailbag Hell for yeah. a listener Q&A. Yes, send us questions. Try to take a look through the backlog first. Because we might get repeats. We might get some repeats. Uh, generally, episode titles will tell you what we're talking about. Except for Q&As, you have to actually go look at the questions. Yeah, I think in the description, we try to kind of notate what yeah, we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Give us feedback on this too, because we, again, we were kind of just researching this True. one from scratch. So yeah, point us toward resources um, that could be helpful. Hopefully, we included. Hopefully, we did an okay job. Yeah, yeah. I think we did this more of like a a theory kind of episode of just like, hey, what's fucked up, and like, what could be better. <laughs> yeah, and then definitely an introduction for us too. Mm -hmm. So we want to learn a lot more about this as we go forward. We don't want this to be like a side project or a an addendum to the overall leftist movement. Yeah, definitely, definitely. If you're wondering, hey, Christine, how do I send you these questions? And Grady, I guess, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one that handles the social media. I'm the so... addendum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the one uh, who handles our communication. So you will technically be sending them to me. That's fine. Grady will see them too. True. If you're like, hey, I want to send a question for this. Where do I go? You can go to our social media. That's Twitter at Teach Communism. Instagram at teach me communism. You can send us an email, teach me communism at gmail.com. Send those questions, suggestions for future episodes, feedback on any other episodes, 
yeah, all that stuff. And also you can and should leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to help people find the show and it makes me feel good. So do it. <laughs> That's what it's all about really, isn't it? Really is. Human needs, including Christine's need for validation. Thank you. <laughs> We are on YouTube. If that's how you like to listen to podcasts, or if you know somebody like that's their jam, do that. And we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash teach me communism. And that's where for five bucks a month, you get access to all of our notes. Um, this week it was a shared doc between me and Grady, and then you will get my like highlighted notes of the reading. You also get access to the backlog. Pretty handy. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great resource. Go back there, check out all that stuff and uh, put some of your money toward uh, your comrades in the form of mutual aid. We'll give it to mutual aid, so. <laughs> yes, that's going to mutual aid, not to us. Uh, well, thanks for uh, doing this reading with me and, and kind of taking our first toe dip into <laughs> this larger topic that we really need to, you know, understand is just central, I guess, to our intersectional uh, leftist struggle against capitalism. Yeah, man, all about that solidarity. Hell yeah. Uh, listeners, thanks for tuning in. You guys are awesome. Uh, check us out next week on another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye. Bye.